Good afternoon. I hope everybody's having a great week. Welcome to our Bible study on Wednesday afternoons in the Overeach Congregation. I'm Sean Weaver. We're glad you're tuning in. We hope that if you have some questions and things that you'll ask those things and submit those to us. Give us a call or just let us know so we can uh, sit down if you've got some more things you'd like to study about so we can take that opportunity with you. We hope that uh, this lesson finds everyone doing okay. And uh, we want to continue to pray for those of our number who are sick and those who are helping to keep watch over them as well. We're going to be continuing to our study of Job. And we looked through some of the first round of uh, where the friends have made their speeches and Job has made those first round of uh, responses to those. And uh, Job has made those responses to those speeches. But uh, tonight we're going to go through this second cycle of those speeches. Let's begin with a word of prayer and then we'll take up our, our lesson uh, beginning um, with uh, Eliphaz in uh, chapter 15 of Job, beginning in verse 1, if you want to be turned there in your Bibles. But let's begin with a word of prayer and then we'll get started, okay? Our Holy Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to be able to uh, open my book, to be able to uh, study these things together. Father, we just pray that you'll help us as we read these things and we reason those things out that you'll help us to be able to discern the truth and that truth will make a difference in our lives father especially if we're going through those times in our lives where there's difficulties we just pray that as as we go through difficulties as other people around us go through difficulties that something in here can help us to to be able to understand better to be able to see things a little more clearly and with a little more love Father, just forgive us for we fail thee. These things through Christ's name we pray. Amen. As I said, we're going through the book of Job and looking at those um, circumstances that are difficult. Um, his friends so far have not offered the kind of encouragement that, that he needs. Um, they've offered, uh, every one of them has, uh, has been going through and basically saying, Job, it's because of your sin that you're going through these terrible times and, and you need to repent. You need to change your ways and that's the reason that you're having these tough times in your life. It's been suggested uh, through commentaries, one, one uh, writer, uh, R. Smith, suggested that this cycle of speeches is, it should be called the fate of the wicked. And certainly Eliphaz is, uh, begins, and kind of kicks off both feet um, and old Job, uh, he was a little bit kinder, I think, in his uh, uh, initial approach, that first cycle. Uh, but this time, he just uh, go, doesn't doesn't offer any kind of niceties at the beginning. He goes straight in for the throat. He begins his speech by questioning Job's wisdom. Let's read together verses one and two of Job fifteen. Then answered Eliphaz the Tenemite and said. Should a wise man utter vain knowledge and fill his bed with the east wind? He begins by challenging Job's assumption that he's right and, and justified contrary to the wisdom of the ancients. Job is really undermining the norms of religion and going against the tradition by claiming that he's innocent. And so... Um, you know, Eliphaz basically says, you know, the evidence is, is overwhelming against you with all these things that are happening. His argument against Job is this. How can you claim to be innocent when God's punishment is, is so evident, when his punishment demonstrates otherwise? If you'll go ahead and read down from verse 3 down through verse 16, I encourage you to do that. We're not going to read every verse tonight. We see that through 16, Eliphaz is charging Job with, with adding the sin of challenging God's wisdom to his initial sin. He reminds Job of the dangers of not having a clear conscience before God and a speedy destruction of the wicked. The message is basically this. You can't win against God. 
So you need to go ahead and change your course. You need to go ahead and repent. Let's get down to verse 24. Verse 24 and 25, Eliphaz says, Trouble and anguish shall make him afraid. They shall prevail against him as a king ready to the battle. For he stretcheth out his hand against God and strengthened himself against the Almighty. So we, we see here, he's just, you know, again, he's tearing into him. He's saying, you think that you're innocent. You keep saying you're innocent, but you're, you're actually adding to that sin because you're challenging God's wisdom by saying that you're innocent, Job. So you need to go ahead and repent. That you need to change. You can't win this argument. Job, as he responds, starting down in chapter 16, he speaks more directly to his friends, I think, in this, this part. But he doesn't necessarily answer their arguments or accusation in a defensive mode. Instead, beginning here in chapter 16, we see where he reasserts his innocence. His reply and speech after Eliphaz's comments have five main points that I want us to see this evening. The first thing I want us to see called out in this response is that he, first of all, reproaches the heartlessness of all his friends, of those three friends that have, that have talked to him up to this point. Beginning in verse 1, he answers and said, I have heard uh, many such things. Miserable comforters are you all. Shall vain words have an end, or what emboldeneth thee? Thou should answer us. I could also speak as ye do. If your souls were in my soul's stead, I could heap up words against you and shake my head at you, but I would strengthen you with my mouth, and the moving of my lips should assuage your grief. What he does is he's rebuking them for the fact that they, they didn't bring anything new to this, to this table. No comfort, no comforting words. He could criticize them too the same way if the shoe were on the other foot. He could also bring comfort, but they hadn't done that. You could have brought comfort, but you chose not to. So that's one of the first things that we see in response. One of the second things that we see in, in Job's second response there to Eliphaz is that he now is claiming that he has been abandoned both by God and by man, even though he's innocent. Verse 14 starts in chapter 16. He breaketh me with breach upon breach. He runneth upon me like a giant. I have so, so sackcloth upon my shins, my skin, and defile my horn in the dust. My face is foul with weeping. And my eyelids are in the shadow of, death, shadow of death, not for any injustice in my hands. Also, my prayer is pure. He is an innocent man that is suffering. That's what he says here. You know, I'm, I've been abandoned. I've been abandoned by man, and, and I've been abandoned by God, I feel like, at this point. And we'll need to remember that. But that's going to come back a little later um, to be reminding him of some things. So the third thing in response to Eliphaz that Job gives is that he declares that the only true witness that he can that, that he has right now that he can count on to declare that he's innocent is God and the angels. That's the only one. He said, just those in heaven are the only ones that can claim my innocence. Verse 18, O earth, cover now Cover not now also my blood, and let my cry have no place. Also now, behold, my witness is in heaven. My record is on high. My friends score me, but mine eyes pour out tears into God. Oh, that one might plead for a man with God, as a man pleadeth for his neighbor. When a few years are come, then I shall go the way whence I shall not return. I think he's, he's correct in this thought, and it's a thought for us to consider too, that where does judgment come from? Well, it comes, it comes from on high. That's what counts, and that's what matters. And Job, rightly so, so, knows that God knows the real story. He knows that God knows the whole story. 
the irony here to me, I, I guess, is that, that that he does his guess correctly, but he don't know why. He says, you know, I know God knows the truth. I know God knows the whole story. I know he can bear witness, but, but nobody here on earth knows that. He, he knows. But Job says it. he knows, but he just doesn't know why he knows. But he does. Number four. What else does Job say in response to Eliphaz? He gives an assessment on the situation, number four. He gives a, a, an assessment concerning the, the relationship, more especially with his friend. In, in short, he's simply become a, a byword, I guess is my word that I use for it, a byword to his friends. Uh, and he criticizes them for this development. What do you mean by that? Well, let's read what it says, and then we'll talk about it for just a second. Beginning in verse 6 of Job chapter 17. He has made me also a byword of the people. And aforetime I was as a tabret. Mine eyes also is dim by reason of sorrow, that my members are, are as a shadow. Upright men shall be astonished at this, and the innocent shall stir up himself against the hypocrite. The righteous also shall hold his way, and he that hath clean hands shall be stronger and stronger. I think the expression by word in this term, uh, in this way it's used here, is really a, a, a way that a person is identified a type. In other words, I'm this guy. I'm become this guy. In Job's case, a, an arrogant sinner who refuses to repent and punished by God. That's what he's saying to his friends. He says, you know, now I'm just a byword. I, they're they're going to say, well, there's that guy. He's one of those that's going to be that guy, that kind of guy. That's what he says. Job's conclusion is that all is lost and death is going to be his only deliverance. Verse 15 and 16. And where now is my hope? As for my hope, who shall see it? They shall go down to the bars of the pit when I rest together is in the dust. In this, I think that we see a kind of a crack in Job's faith. Not a, not a crack in his faith in God's existence, but rather a kind of a lessening in what he thinks that God can do for him. He figures at this point, just by what we can read here, that, that all is lost. And the only thing left for him to do is just die in order to end his suffering. I think we need to also keep this in mind when we come to the end of the book and we get God's answer on the situation. The next friend that we want to talk about is Bildad. This is the second set of speech from Bildad in chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. Bildad also seems to be less tactful. Now, he wasn't very tactful to begin with, but you can really see him becoming more irritated as he pursues this condemnation uh, on Job. His second speech tells Job, look, this situation that you're in is just a foretaste of what you're fixing to suffer. It's just going to get worse from here. Now, listen to what he says in verses 5 and 6. Yea, the light of the wicked shall be put out, and the spark of his fire shall not shine. The light shall be dark in his tabernacle, and his candle shall be put out with him. It's to me a reminder of, of how we must speak the truth. Now, if you can't speak the truth in love, then it's not going to be effective. I, I don't care how you know certain you are and, and, and how much you thump and jump up and down and, and pitch a fit about it, unless that truth is in love and it comes across out of love because they know you love, then that truth's not going to be heard. And that's basically what we see here, this this, what Bildad's doing is he's just humping, uh, just, just heaping these, these coals on, on Job's head right here. It, he says basically in verses uh, 17 through 21, Job, this is, this is what God does to the wicked. Nobody's going to remember you, Job. You're just going to 
You're just going to be a, 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 a something that's passing by because of your wickedness. Verse 17, his remembrance shall perish from the earth. He shall have no name in the street. He shall be driven from the light into darkness and chased out of the world. He shall neither have a son nor nephew among his people, nor any remaining in his dwellings. They that come after him shall be astonished in his day, as they that went before him were affrighted. Surely such are the dwellings of the wicked, and this is the place of him that knoweth not God. Now it's Job's turn. Now we see, again, this is not something that's spoken out of love. They believe that they're doing some good, but they're not offering any kind of good as far as Job is concerned. Uh, we see Job, again, going a little farther into his reply that just how much this is hurting instead of helping Job. In his isolation, he's rejected, you remember, by his wife, and now by his friend, Job cries out for sympathy. I think that, that, that I share the view with several that I've read commentary-wise that this is probably the, one of the highlights of the entire book. Job begins in, in chapter 19, verse 1, um, by protesting his friend's lack of understanding. Verses 3 and 4. At least ten times, you have reproached me. You're not ashamed that you make yourself strange to me. And be it indeed that I have erred, mine error remaineth with myself. He, he removes this argument that, that whatever they think he's done wrong, the truth is God has punished an innocent man. He wishes that they would understand this. Down in verses 5 and 6, again, Indeed, you will magnify yourselves against me, plead against me my reproach. Know not that God hath overthrown me and hath compassed me with his net. Job is protesting his friend's understanding and he's also seeing himself as being despised by both God and man. It's a true low point. How could it get worse for Job? Chapter 19, verse 10 He's destroyed me on every side, and I'm gone. And my hope hath he removed like a tree. Down in verse 13. He's put my brethren far from me, and my acquaintance are very, very estranged from me. Now that's tough. It's a tough predicament to be in. He said, I can't count on anybody here on this earth. Uh, I can't count on you. They're supposed to be my friends. I, I've lost everything at this point. You've made me like a stranger. You have, you have turned your back on me. Now in verse 25, um, we see him making this final appeal to, to God himself. He says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. We recognize that part of that verse 25, don't we? We got a hymn that we sing that says this very statement, I know that my Redeemer lives. In other words, he believes that God alone is the one who's able to redeem. Here we see a definite shift in Job's thinking. At his lowest point, he's rejected by, by, by men, he's rejected by everything on earth, he feels like he's been rejected by God, yet Job continues to hope in God. Not simply a belief that he is, but he's a redeemer. He's a savior. He's going to save Job somehow. I know that my redeemer lives. Now folks, that's one of those statements we need to take it and cut that out. Write that down on a piece of paper. Put it on your refrigerator. Put it in your billfold. Put it in your purse. That way we can remind ourselves often that no matter what uh, happens, no matter how dark this cloud is that we're going through, we know that our Redeemer lives. 
Amen. Job finishes off with a warning for his three friends here. Verses 28 and 29. Again, this is another good one here. Verse 28. But ye should say, Why persecute we him, seeing the root of the matter is found in me? Be ye afraid of the sword, for wrath bringeth the punishment of the sword, that you may know that there is a judgment. Today, Here's how we say that statement that he makes in verses 28 and 29. Be careful what goes around comes around. And these things can fall on you too. You're not above those problems. You're not above those problems. And I think that's another point to take with us too. Just because, and there's a statement that's pretty popular, just because someone sins differently than you do doesn't mean that you're better than them. And I think that's a, a good point to take with us. Now, we're going to look at the third friend. And then that will conclude tonight. We're going to look at the third friend and the third response. So far, chapter 20, verse 1. And uh, then we're going to start getting into the, the, slide, the last set. And then we'll see what God has to say to Job after that. Um, so far, chapter 20 and verse 1, this friend merely, he just repeats what he said before. Affliction is a result of sin. But then we see something that's a little doubt in, in what he says here. He kind of doubts his own theory and argument for just a moment. But we'll see him kind of fade back into it. Verses 2 and 3 of Job chapter 20. Therefore, do my thoughts cause me to answer and for this I make, my, I make haste. I have heard the check of my reproach and the spirit of my understanding causeth me an answer. He's disturbed about the things he's thinking about right here on account of Job's comments. Shows that he's momentarily kind of shaken in his uh, position. However, he seemed just reverting right back to this initial argument that, that you know, bad things happen to bad people. Good things happen to good people. Verses 27 through 29, he continues to argue that no matter how rich, no matter how favored, no matter how high position one has, if he sinned, then he's going to be brought low. And he speculates that while Job's arguments and claims may have affected him, he declares that he does not know any more about Job than Job does about all the things that are circumstances that are surrounding his situation. He also rejects Job's declaration that he's innocent, who still trusts in God to vindicate him. So here's Job's response. Chapter 21, uh, verses of 1 through 34, we see this response. His, his reply to Zophar is actually comments on the subject of Zophar's speech, which has to do with the prosperity of wicked men. So listen how he answers this. He begins, first of all, by questioning this um, age-old question here that comes up about how the wicked sometimes prosper, uh, how the justice doesn't always happen in real time like they're saying. Verse 7, beginning. Wherefore do the wicked live and become whole, become old, and are yet mighty in power? Their seed is established in their sight with them, and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear. Neither is the rod of God upon them. In essence, it seems like that, just like David had noted in, in, in the psalm, that sometimes the wicked prosper. Sometimes they live and prosper without any negative comment, uh, any negative uh, consequences to those actions. Then he goes on to question in this law of retribution that we keep talking about. Uh, this law, God blessing the punishment, uh, blesses and punishes in real time here. By pointing out this, that this, these common examples that we see all the time, they contradict this ancient wisdom that they have concerning this law of uh, retribution. He also notes that heredity guilt is not true or moral. What I mean by that is that the sons bear the guilt or punishment of the sins of the father. That's a point also made by the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 18. 
in verse 20. We see this argument in chapter, nine, or chapter 21, beginning in verse 19. God layeth upon his iniquity for his children, and he rewards them, and he shall know it. His eyes shall see his destruction, and he shall drink of the wrath of the Almighty. For what pleasure hath he in his house after him, when the number of his months is cut off in the midst? Shall any teaching of God, of God knowledge, um, seeing he judges those that are high, one dies in his full strength, being holy at ease and quiet, his breasts are full of milk, his bones are moistened with marrow, and another died from the bitterness of his soul, and never eateth with pleasure. They shall lie down alike in the dust, and the worms shall cover them. The point that he makes in this observation, we see kind of plain. Many wicked people grow rich, and they stay that way, and they die peacefully at a ripe old age. Nothing bad ever happens to them in their life. Uh, nothing bad happens to the sons that they leave behind. But we also see, on the other hand, many righteous people who live in hard lives, who are full of troubles. They die in the midst of poverty. They die at a young age. Much like Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes, Job says here that these inconsistencies are not uncommon. They happen. And death seems to be the great equalizer in all of this. What did he say? Verse 26, they shall lie down alike in the dust and the worms shall cover them. In Job 30 through 34, Job has not only put his case for final judgment into God's hand for a future day, along with that of the wicked who shall likewise be judged, but also has rejected the basis of his friend's arguments and assumptions against him as false goods. Job, I think, is laying the groundwork for a new argument, a new wisdom, that says sometimes the innocent suffer and the wicked go free. But one day, one day, God will judge their actions in his wisdom in his understanding, not theirs, not man's. Next week, we're going to take up this, reviewing this last French speeches, along with Job's summary of his experiences. And then we're going to see another speech by another young man named Elihu, which kind of serves as a bridge for this important questioning of Job by God himself. I hope you'll tune in. I hope you'll share this with others. And Please continue to pray for this effort and pray for, for us in this effort. Pray for wisdom and understanding and, and the ability to be able to continue to, to lay these things out. I want to invite you to come and be a part of our, my, our Sunday morning in, in worship service beginning at 9.30 a.m. Uh, we're also recording this and posting it on YouTube and Facebook uh, on our pages there. May God bless you. Hope you have a great, safe rest of the week, and we look forward to, to seeing you in any opportunity.